Good afternoon and welcome to our viewers and a special shout out to any teachers and students who are joining us virtually today. I'm Allison Bainbridge and I have the privilege of introducing our fantastic panel of speakers today. They have created the consummate guide to crush and girlhood, girlhood and living your feminism out loud called Feminist AF. Hip hop and feminism combine in the empowering guide with attitude from best-selling authors Brittany Cooper and founding members of the Crunk Feminist Collective. Having raised two daughters, I wish that something like this was available for them as well as for myself growing up in the 60s and 70s. Loud and rowdy girls, quiet and nerdy girls, girls who rock naturals, girls who wear weave, outspoken and opinionated girls, still finding their voice, queer girls, trans girls, gender, non-binary young people who want to make the world better. This book uses the insights of feminism to address issues relevant to today's young women. It covers colorism and politics, romance and pleasure, code switching and sexual violence. Feminist AF addresses questions such as, what do you do when you feel like your natural hair is ugly or when classmates keep touching it? How do you handle your self-confidence if your family or culture prizes fair-skinned women over darker skinned ones? How do you balance your identities if you're an immigrant or the child of immigrants? How do you dress and present yourself in ways that feel good when society condemns anything outside the norm? The book's three fabulous authors are joining us here today. It's, we have Brittany Cooper, who's an American author, professor, activist, and cultural critic. Her areas of research and work include Black women organizations, Black women intellectuals, and hip-hop feminism in 2013 and 2014. She was named to the Roots.com Route 100, an annual list of Black influencers. Susanna Morris is an associate professor of literature, media, and communication at the Georgia Institute of Tech. She is co-founder and contributing writer for the popular feminist blog, The Crunk Feminist Collection. Her first book, Close Kin and Distant Relatives, The Paradox of Respectability in Black Women's Literature, was published in 2014. And Chanel Craft Tanner, PhD, is a director of the Center for Women at Emory and founding member of the Crunk Feminist Collective. Please feel free to ask questions in our chat feature. Uh, the authors will take your questions as they are available. Um, and now without further ado, the authors of Feminist AF. What's up everybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Book Passage. Thank you, everyone. How y'all doing? Um, so we heard that we have some, you know, some folks watching today. We're going to do our best to just chop it up a little bit about why we wrote this book and what we hope it accomplishes. And so feel free to send us questions. We, we can take them as they come in. Um, if you want to wait till we've talked for a bit and then ask, that's fine too. Um, but we're really excited to be in conversation with you. Um, so again, I'm Brittany and I'm with Susanna and Chanel. Uh, we are part of a crew of folks who have been working and writing together since 2010 called the Crunk Feminist Collective. Uh, we'll talk in a bit a bit more about what we do at the Crunk Feminist Collective and what we mean by that. Um, but we thought we would begin by talking about why we wrote this book. So why do we write this book? Yeah, I mean, we were girls. <laughs> so we wrote this book in so many ways for, you know, little Brittany, little Chanel, little Susanna. We were given, presented the opportunity to write a book for young feminists or to use feminism to talk to young folks about navigating girlhood, we really just sat down and thought about, well, what is it that they need? And we really, it really was the things that we needed when we were coming up. So we wrote the book for, you know, to kind of address the challenges we faced, but we've also all served as um, aunties and big sisters and big cousins and god sisters for so many young people in our lives. Um, who would now be considered, you know, Gen Z. And so a lot of what we did is just took those car ride conversations that we were already having with them and just wrote them down so that others could benefit from the things that we navigated with them. Also, we wrote it for the, the generation coming up, Generation Alpha. I have a nine-year-old little girl who, when she was six, decided that she was a feminist. And that was amazing to me because something that I didn't even know was a thing until I was 18 and taking my first women's studies class in college. And so for her to be six and declaring with such certainty that she was a feminist, we were super excited, but we knew that the time would come where, you know, books like Rebel Girl 
examples in uh, shows like Black Girls Rock and, you know, that representation wasn't going to be enough to nurture her feminism. We knew her relationships with her friends would get more complicated. She would start maybe having romantic feelings for people. I would stop being her best friend and she, you know, be like, I can't stand my mom. I'm ready to get out this house. And so we wanted to also give a guide for her, for someone who already identifies as feminism, as feminist, but doesn't know how to apply it yet. So this is this in so many ways is about feminism in real life and what it looks like and how it can be a really useful uh, tool to navigating our lives. Yeah, I would just add that uh, the book is also for parents, aunts, uncles, uncles, whoever's in the village who is helping to raise young people. You can read it back to front. You can pull out a chapter. If you're a young person that's like, oh, I want to start dating someone and you're like, okay, I, 13, 14, I didn't know you were going to come to me with this or whatever age, you can pull out that chapter. Y'all can talk about it together. So it's a resource guide for adults as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so the title of this book is Feminist AF. What do we mean when we say feminism and why the AF? I mean, it's kind of crump why we say that like that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, we include a glossary of terms in the book, and so we define terms from ableism to white supremacy uh, in order for readers to really know, like, how are we defining these terms? Because a term like feminism has, you know, a lot of different uh, meanings, right? Some folks, when they hear the word feminist, they think like bra burning, I hate men, you know, those kinds of stereotypes. But we really mean a specific thing. So In the glossary, we define feminism as a social movement and set of beliefs that aims to tear down the system of male domination known as the patriarchy. Ideally, this movement is also anti-racist and anti-elitist. So we're talking about big concepts like white supremacy and racism, right? And we're talking about capitalism as well. We think that these are... uh, topics that young people already are curious about or know something about. So we're not trying to talk down to young people. We're like, okay, you want to know about racism and white supremacy? Let's talk about it. Uh, You want to think about how capitalism organizes our lives? Let's talk about it. So our feminism is really built on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And we also use the term crunk feminism, right? So Chanel, you want to talk a little bit about the CFC and what we mean when we say crunk? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the the flat, the front flap of the book actually does a really good job. Um, and it says, you know, we're hip hop generation feminists. The soundtrack to our lives is filled with bass and booties and plenty of cussing. It's irreverent and just our speed because trying to be a damn lady has never been the goal of our feminism. Crunk music is filled with raucous, in your face, take no prisoners energy. It always gets the party started. And once you've experienced it, you are forever changed. At least we were. That's what feminism means to us. So it's a kind of an energy. We, you know, we came up in the hip hop era, hip hop generation. Crunk music was super important to when we were becoming young adults ourselves. That was the music that filled the energy. But we were also learning feminism at the same time. We were learning how to live it out. And so we really practice an unapologetic you know, notion of feminism that worked for us. We are crunk feminists. And so we are, this is an invitation for young people to be unapologetic in their feminism, to wear that badge proudly, because it is really a, a dope way to understand and, ana- and analyze your world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, go ahead. I was just going to say, crunk music is, you know, our stuff from the early 2000s, and y'all might think of yourselves as trap feminists or whatever. You don't have to be a crunk feminist, but we're sort of just giving you a model that you don't have to throw away the pop culture that you love in order to have good politics. You can love Cardi, you can love Megan, you can love Lizzo, all those things, and you can still be a feminist. You can have feminist politics. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we all, who doesn't love Meg's knees? I mean, we all do, uh, you know, um, we all, I I mean, listen, you know, and y'all need to use your knees while you got them because you'll wake up one day and they'll be gone, which is really the Mm -hmm. point, right? Mm -hmm. But also, Mm -hmm. you know, this kind of, the feminism we're talking about gives us the space to understand the, the position Meg was in when she gets shot by her raggedy boyfriend, right? And then the first move from everybody is to say, did it happen to call her a snitch when she, you know, said that Tory Lanez had actually shot her? Um, That is a feminist issue because quite frankly, we, you know, we're losing something like 
for uh, black women and girls a day to violence. Um, and most of that happens, you know, uh, it's typically gun violence. Um, and so this is a way to think about how patriarchy shows up in our lives. What you have is somebody like Meg, who is super dope, who is killing the game right now. And then you have a, a, her dude or her dude at that time who was jealous. Now, I also saw on Instagram some very suggestive pictures uh, this morning where she's with her current dude and he got a big yes. tattoo. Feminist on That's the floor. Feminist on and I was like, and this is right? gone. She is gone. And we've lost our good sis. <laughs> <laughs> no more hot girls. Like, Come on, it's party. Up love. Love. Yes, absolutely. Love, you better love. be in love with a feminist. <laughs> I mean, listen, we will have look here. This feminist love is the best love. This is what we're trying to tell you. Um, <laughs> and so that's, you know, so that's some of what we mean. Um, you know, but we also recognize, so one of the things we do in this book is we try to center girls of color, uh, right? So from the cover, uh, from the front cover to the back cover, you're going to get a feminism that's really rooted in the experiences of girls of color. Um and, you know, I wonder if y'all have some thoughts about that, because, you know, we may have folks watching who are girls of color and we may have folks who like white folks watching uh, non people of color, you know. And so why this and, you know, what is and how do we think about what it means to be what it means to center people of color in the way that we talk about feminism? Yeah, I think first what I would say is centering doesn't mean excluding. Um, and so it's very important that we make that declaration. And so when we sat and wrote the book and thought about, you know, our audience, uh, we were really thinking about, like I said, our future, I mean, our past selves. We were thinking about, you know, young girls of color that we knew that we we're in community with and this, you know, specific things that they go through. But it doesn't mean that other people you know, are excluded from the text. So what we're seeing as we are going around the country and talking about this book is how many adult women are saying like, yes, that's exactly what, you know, what I needed. Um, and so I think the book is for everyone, even though we made it very clear that we wanted to make sure that girls of color, that gender non-binary young people of color, like understood that feminism is something that is for them. Um, and so, yeah, and because of that, you know, it actually expands our definition of what feminism is and what it can do. So we insert conversations around colorism and that's important. And that's not something that typically, you know, you may see in mainstream feminist movements, but because we are centering girls of color, how colorism affects their lives matters. And yes, it's totally about race and it's totally about colonialism, but it plays out for the girls in our communities in a very different way, in a very specific way. So by bringing that into the feminist, um, into a book about feminism, it allows us to apply that lens, one that says this is both sexist and racist at the same time, um, so that girls can have that to understand how power operates in that way. Yeah. I would also add that it's important for us to think about why we consider what we consider universal. Why is Shakespeare universal? I'm sure, especially those of y'all who are in school now, you're reading all kinds of Shakespeare, Mark Twain's, Jane Austen's. And as an English professor, I'm not going to tell you that those works are terrible and you should read them. I think they're important, right? But so is Alice Walker, right? Um, so is Sandra Cisneros. So is Toni Morrison or Octavia E. Butler. There are so many folks of color, women, queer, trans folks, that that's niche, that's specialty, that's an elective. No, let's center it. So in the book, for example, we start the, the trajectory of feminism with Mariah Stewart, who was an early 19th century African-American woman. She lived in Boston for a chunk of her career, and she was a free Black woman. This was during slavery, but she was a free Black woman, and she spoke to audiences, mixed gender audiences, uh, about feminist issues, right? What if we start there and not with Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, right? Let's start with Mariah Stewart, right? Because communities of color have always had our own kind of feminism, so we want us to all rethink what is the center, what is the beginning of the past? Right. And that's good for people of color. And it's good for white folk too to not always be in the center of the conversation, to not always be the hero or the heroine. 
and quite frankly, we don't live on the planet by ourselves, you know, so sometimes white women will tweet me and say, you know, you even though you, you know, this like another book that I wrote, you know, it wasn't for me, but I got so much out of it. And I thought like, to Susanna's point, what if we were out here as people of color being like, this Jane Austen wasn't for me, but you know, I got so much out of it. Shakespeare wasn't thinking about me, but I got so much out of it. We would never say that because it sounds absurd. Like who says that, right? And so a book about feminism is a book for everybody because the concerns that matter to us in feminism, violence against women, how, you know, how you become a leader, what your dating life look like, what your friendships look like. Those are things that everybody is navigating at this, you know, all, quite frankly, even adults are navigating those things, but certainly young folks are navigating those things. And so talking about how they may show up in the lives of girls of color doesn't mean that there's not insight here for absolutely everyone, right? And and I think that that's important mm -hmm. um, to say or to think through. Um, you know, we get into some, some, some realness, some heavy stuff um, in this book because you know, one of the reasons we need a movement, one of the reasons that we need a feminist revolution is precisely because everything is not okay. And sometimes the girls are not doing all right. Sometimes gender expansive youth are not doing all right. Um, and so can y'all talk a little bit about what were some of the tougher parts of this book to write? Yeah, so the book, you know, is broken down into different sections. So we have a section on pretty much the self, on beauty, on relationships, and then on like, how do we apply it to change the world? Like some of those isms. So in that relationship portion, we talk about dating. And that was a particularly challenging section for me to draft. Um, and so we each kind of had a process where we drafted some, we'd come back together, we'd have conversations, we'd go back apart, we'd come back together, we share our edits. And so it was truly a collaborative um, process um, all the way through. And we've touched every section of it. So it was my turn to draft a dating section. I journaled all through high school um, and through middle school. And so I returned to the journals to, because I knew that I had some, you know, stuff in there about dating. Um, but it was really hard to look back through those journals and to see, you know, not only, you know, those very strong feelings around my first loves, but also my first heartbreak and my first, you know, betrayal and rejection and just very strong feelings. And I think, you know, I was seeing the way gaslighting was operating for me, um, where, you know, it was like, I know I saw what I thought I saw, but you're telling me I didn't have evidence or so where's the proof or that didn't happen, even though I know it happened. But I didn't have that language of gaslighting, which we kind of provide a nice detailed you know, definition of what that is. Because it's so important because so much of my relationships as a young person, you know, felt like there was gaslighting being involved there. But what was most hurtful was looking back at that and remembering that I didn't have adults in my life that I could go to about those feelings because it was very clear that, you know, my priority needed to be on school and that if I was having any feelings, they were just called puppy love. So the adults in my life were very dismissive of what I felt like were very strong feelings. And so it was hard to be there, um, to go back in that space, but I'm so glad that um, I took the time to do that because I think we offer some really good gems for young people and we validate their feelings. We say, if you feel it, then it's real. Um, we don't say that, you know, we're, we're not dismissing them. And we hope that the adults who are reading also do the same thing to start really treating those as real feelings and helping the young people in their lives to navigate them the best that they can. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, for me, the section that was the most challenging to like initially draft was the I'm coming out chapter. So today I identify as a queer femme, but back in the day I did not. And I was raised uh, in a very strict household with really strict notions of what was appropriate, you know, to be Christian, right? And one could not be gay or bisexual or queer, or trans or non-binary. I was taught that that meant you were going to hell. So when I was a young person, I had a crush on this guy and I thought he liked me too. I thought he was me you know what I mean we were flirting and everything I'm talking about him with my homegirls we laughing uh and then it was time for this dance to come around so I'm like okay he's gonna ask me I'm ready and then he totally asked my homegirl and I was crushed it was a complete face crack moment 
And, but my home girl honored the girl code. She knew I went with him. So she rejected him. I rose again inside, you know, because he had the face crack of the century. Uh, and then we walked off together because we were next door neighbors. And I just go back and kind of reimagine. I didn't even allow myself to imagine like, why was I feeling him? I and mean, he was fine and all that, but she was dope. I didn't even allow myself to go there because I didn't live in a world where that was even a possibility. So I speak to, you know, queer young folk or folks who are just questioning or thinking about sexuality and, you know, just remind us all that sexuality, like gender presentation is fluid. You can identify as different things at different points in your life. And that's cool. Um, you don't have to like anybody at all, whether it's as a teenager or in life. Asexual, asexuality is completely valid. Whatever you like, it's fine. As long as we're not being raggedy to one another, that is the only barometer we have. It's be good, be kind, respect people's boundaries, you know, enthusiastic consent. Those are the things right about. But the gender of your boo, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Word. What about you, B? Yeah. Um, you know, I write about um, having um, a tough childhood. Um, my dad uh, was killed when I was nine. Um, he was killed on a weekend um, violently and, um, you know, and I missed no school. Like it was still the school year, you know, he died on a Saturday and I got up and went to school on Monday and then we had his funeral the next Saturday and I got up and I went to school the next week. And, you know, and I write about that for a couple of reasons. One, because I had already at that very young age internalized the idea that I was supposed to be strong that that is what I sort of owed myself and owed everyone else that I didn't have the space to fall apart. I didn't have the space mm. to grieve or the space to say like, this is too heavy for me to carry. Um, and our, in our experience, you know, young people of color are often caring and a lot, they see a lot just because of the social conditions that we face. Um, and sometimes particularly with girls of color, everyone thinks we're so resilient already and that we're just rolling with the punches um, and that we don't need to be taken care of. Of. And what was even more sort of interesting about it is I was making straight A's, right? I was academically, you know, you know, knocking it out of the park. And so if you looked at my grades or my performance, it was no indicator of how I was actually feeling or what was going on. And quite frankly, I was using school as a way to escape the chaos and the grief and all of that stuff. Um, and we wanted to name that for young people and for adults in the lives of people of color, young people of color to like recognize that the fact that they're doing well in school is not often an indicator that they are mentally well and that everything is okay. And so you should begin to attend to those other parts of life and then begin to ask some questions about that, right? Um, but also, you know, the other thing that then happened is that because I wasn't able to process that grief and didn't know what to do with it, you know, I struggled with suicidal ideation as a very young person, as like an 11 and 12 year old. Um, and what we wanted to name was that even though that is not okay to deal with, it is a common part of life. Um, you know, sometimes when the world gets too heavy, you might be feeling like, what is this all for? And we have resources in the book. We encourage you to find a trusted adult to reach out to. But mostly we just want to name that it is OK if you feel overwhelmed by all of the pressures on you to perform, to get it right. And those pressures shift and change, right, depending. So for me, it was because I was a working class girl. My mother was a teen mother. And then here I am with a father who had struggled with addiction and then been killed. And so I always already grew up with this sort of narrative that people like me and quote unquote broken homes become statistics. And I very much did not want that for myself. And so I laid my mental health to the side, even at nine, right? Even mm -hmm. that young, because I didn't want to become a statistic. And that pressure on young people of color to not reflect the quote unquote worst parts of our community, which is like language that we reject entirely, but the pressure to be a model minority um, right, um, is, you know, uh, is part of the challenge uh, and is one of the things that we wanted to name and to, um, and to just affirm, you know, uh, that, 
it, that life can get heavy. And that more than all of that, part of the reason that this is a feminist issue is because we deserve a set of structures in our lives so that maybe my mom could have taken time off of work and maybe I could have taken time off of school and had a little bit of space to process my grief. Or maybe there were mental health professionals in my school that I could have gone to talk to, right? That the, because my mother, you know, had only her salary and she didn't make a lot of money. And so affording therapy was a really hard thing. But perhaps if we put therapists in schools and not police officers in schools to deal with challenges, then young people would feel better. But see, that's a, a, a feminist analysis of a problem. So it's not just enough for me to say, own it, know that your feelings matter. We're also saying that politically, what we owe you and what we're fighting for as feminists is a set of structures that support us through the life challenges that all of us will inevitably face at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a quick question in the chat. This book is perfectly pitched for a 12 year old. So absolutely. Um, it's a great gift to give to someone for, for their birthday. Um, yeah. all right. So even though it gets heavy, uh, you know, like we said, we like to shake it off. So what were some fun parts of this book, um, for y'all? Yeah, I think it was important for us to to balance it because that's what our feminism looks like, right? It's heavy, but it's also fun um, and communal. So, you know, one of the things we say is feminism is fun. It makes life better. Don't believe it when people tell you that feminists hate men. Don't believe it when they tell you that we ruin all the fun. Don't believe it when they say we are only angry. Our lives are filled with so much joy and passion and purpose. And that is the 100% truth. So um, one of the funnest chapters to write, I think, was the bossing up uh, chapter. It was like our take on a, you know, confidence building chapter for, for girls. Um, girls tend to start, their confidence starts dipping, um, like kind of between the age of nine and 12. And so for the audience that we were writing to, we knew that this would be around the time where maybe they were starting to lose their confidence or they're noticing themselves like, dang, I was so fly in fourth grade. Like I was getting it. And now all of a sudden, like, where'd that girl go? Um, and so we we kind of went there. Um, we talked about bossing up, not in a capitalist uh, framework. So for us, we define it as, you know, it's origin in hip hop. It's the opposite of hierarchical, domineering, and competitive. Instead, we say it's the act of directing, directing the full capacity of your time, talents, and attention toward a specific goal, dream, or intention. It's owning your own power and purpose in the face of obstacles. It's stepping up and or raising your standard. It's the pre-steps to being bossed up, slaying, or succeeding in something amazing. And so we really offer that as a definition of bossing up. And then we kind of go through, you know, three different types of ways that girls can boss up. So we talk to the girl who's already, you know, captain of the cheerleading team, makes straight A's, has her five-year plan. She knows where she's going to college. She knows what she's going to do, like whole thing. What, what does she need to, to stay a boss and to expand that bossness that she already has? We talk to the regular schmegler degla girl who's, on the baseball team, but maybe she doesn't start. She's on the you know yearbook committee, but she's not the editor in chief. So what does she need? Um, and for most of it, we say you don't need anything. It's absolutely fine to just play your play your part. But we do ask like for her to just do some some self checking, making sure that she's not like limiting herself or afraid or feeling like she doesn't belong and can't do it. And then we talk to the girl who's like, I'm dope. I'm better than half the people in this class but they won't let me be great, right? Maybe you have a racist teacher. Maybe you have, you know, you, some sexism happening on the team because you're the only girl on the on the soccer team and they're not like in you play, but you know, you're better than most of the boys on the team. So we give some advice for them too. Then we end with a really cool bossing up playlist that has songs like Remy Ma's Conceited and Beyonce's Flawless. And so that was just a really fun chapter to think through and write. Um, so yeah, that that's my pick. What about you, Susanna? Yeah, I would add, I really love our section on talismans. So we talk about talismans as like good luck charms or things that you use to like boost your confidence or, or things that you wear that, you know, just make you feel good. So for me, it's lipstick. I'm a lipstick person. Um, today I'm wearing, you know, I'll be like a YouTuber. Oh, y'all can Okay, there it is, Mented 
Bear Brown. And this is a company that is like focused on women of color, on people of color. So brown skin. And so I like to support that. But yeah, I, if I'm feeling raggedy, I can put some lipstick on and I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a little dusty, a little ashy, but the lipstick is going to kind of take me, take me up. So why don't y'all share what your talismans are too? Mine are my mine. Jordans. I'm always, you know, when I really want to feel like myself, I'm going to throw on a pair of Jordans or my Air Max. It feels like it connects to my working class communities because our sneaker game mattered. And so it's my J's for me. Hoop earrings. I always wear hoops. I pretty much only exclusively wear hoops. Um, and if you look at my baby's baby pictures, I got on baby hoops. Um, so they're the thing that make me feel like my look is complete uh, whenever I leave mm -hmm, the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gives you your judge. You Absolutely. I mean? Okay. So what is your, what was your favorite part? Mm. The right. Um, well, I liked, so I liked my contributions to the boot up chapter uh, because, you know, I was a little bit, you know, I had game, you know, at like 14. Yes. You know, I was you out here up, in the street. Up. Yeah. Boot up. Yeah. So, because, so one of the things we're trying to do in that chapter is like talk about feminist like partnership and like what does it mean to do feminist dating? And one of the things it means is like to throw off all of these outmoded gender roles and to go for what you want, right? And so that fem people don't have to wait to be asked you can ask you can shoot your shot and even though everybody says that right what if like flirting terrifies you or you're afraid of being rejected or you don't really know how to do it and so we have like some very practical tips around that um you know and for me part of the thing that I learned as a young person around around that you know because I thought in my 20s like that I that that's how I became that person in my 20s because I frankly what nobody nobody was kicking it to me like I'm a fat girl even if you cannot tell on the screen like I'm a big old girl and being dark skinned with a natural hair with natural hair and being a big girl sometimes it can be hard out here for a fat femme uh to find someone because we live in a fat phobic culture right and I was like but I'm still dope like screw that so I would just ask people out well you know but I realized as we were writing this book and being reflective that I actually had been asking them out even in high school, even before I had the language of feminism. I was just like, well, why? Like, I didn't always get the rules. So I was like, well, why can't I like that person? So sometimes I like tell a homeboy, can you go over here and tell him that I want him? And he should like see what's up with me or whatever. So like, that's one way that I did it is I like had me a go between or whatever. Sometimes I would just roll up on dudes and be like, you know, I like you. What's up with you? And I'm not saying that that wasn't hard because sometimes you do get rejected you know and part of the thing we also say in this book is like be okay with rejection because one of the challenges of patriarchy is we live in a world where particularly masculine identified folks mostly cisgender men be ready to literally kill folk who they kick it to for because the, these people say no right because typically because it's a woman saying no to them get comfortable normalize that you know just because you want somebody does not mean that they want you but there's somebody who does want you right um and it might take you a minute to find them but you still can be out in the world participating and asking for what you want and what you need um because i think that sometimes part of that confidence dip that happens is we're like well we're watching everybody and why don't nobody see me why you know why is everybody always passing over me but that puts you in this mind frame where other people get to do the choosing and you're the one waiting to be chosen. And if you're not careful, that passivity can follow you into your life and you will always be out here waiting on somebody to choose you and never recognizing that you get to choose the life you want. You get to have some say over what your love life looks like or what have you. So, you know, so I'm saying be out here, shoot all the shots, um, take the risk, ask her out, you know, do your thing um, because, you know, um, it's fun. And you might also surprisingly get a yes. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people be like, man, I was feeling nervous. I didn't even know how to do it. Um, and I also feel like because I was, I've always been loud like this, like always kind of rowdy. And I feel like people didn't always know how to approach me or whatever. And so I just be like, you know what, I'll solve this problem for you. And I'll just go ahead and, and see what's up with you. Right. Because I'm a gift. And, you know, this is the confidence that you need. And it's the confidence that feminism gives you. So it was a lot of fun to revisit that because I also thought, man, I need to like reclaim some of that swag, you know, and we telling y'all to like refine the swag now and then take it with you throughout your entire life. Yeah. Um, all right. So 
Uh, now's the time for y'all to start dropping your questions in the chat. What y'all want to talk about? Uh, there's a lot in this book. We're going to talk now about our black, our better feminist friendships code. Um, but there's all kind of good stuff in here that, you know, that we haven't gotten to navigating your family and all of the dynamics with that navigating sex and all the dynamics with that. Um, but we are crew and we mentioned that we, you know, that we, uh, crunk feminism is a thing that matters to us. We're part of the crunk feminist collective, which is a crew of seven folks who write together, who are activists, um, teachers. Uh, we have a bona fide Hollywood director in the crew, which is super cool. Um, and we have a commitment to each other and to being good feminist friends to each other and then doing feminist work in the world. So ladies, what is y'all's favorite article and of the 11 articles in the Better Feminist Friendships Code? This is also one of the fun chapters uh, yeah. to write and one of the fun sections to write. And so we, in this section on the Feminist Friendship Code, thought about like, what's the difference between like our regular homegirls and our feminist friendships. And what we say is our feminist friendships are freaking awesome. They are friendships that are governed by respect and mutuality and end up making you a better person. We lead with love. We prioritize loving, affirming, and fun interactions with each other above all else. And then we go into these articles. And so for me, I really like article five. Uh, we will be our friend's mirrors when they cannot see themselves. So friends do not and this is important for the young people who, who are watching, who may, you know, the high school, middle school you, tends to be a place where you start seeing some of that mean girl uh, behavior happening. And But these are people who are supposed to be your friends. And so um, what we say here is friends do not make fr friends feel bad about their looks. Friends do not make friends feel ashamed of their unique gifts and abilities. Friends do not let friends beat themselves up about not reaching arbitrary goals or accomplishments. We tell our friends they are beautiful, even when they feel like they are not. We build them up. We shine a light on their value and their worth. When we say all our bitches bad, we aren't talking, and we curse a little in this book, just, just to let you know. <laughs> we aren't talking about something as frivolous as their looks. We're talking about their dope and unique personality, skills, and gifts they bring the world. It is our job to show them when they cannot see. So that's one way that you would know, like if this is a feminist friendship because it feels good and they, they hype you up, you should be hyping up your girls, yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite articles is article number four, which is we will let our homegirls define themselves for themselves, which I think is really important. Uh, it's not our job to tell other people how they feel or how they should identify. If a friend says something upsets her, it is not your job to make her feel like her feeling not valid. Even if it's something that would not have offended us, we affirm her feelings and make sure she knows they are valid. If our friend says she loves other women, we don't ask her if she's sure or try to dissuade her. We congratulate her bravery and ask her about her crushes and we make sure they're not raggedy. And <laughs> most important, if our girl, if our friend says she's a girl, then she's a goddamn girl. This is a sisterhood S-I-S-T-E-R-H-O-O-D, not a sisterhood, C-I-S-T-E-R-H-O-O-D. There is no homophobia or transphobia allowed. All are welcome. So yeah, where our friendships grow and change as people grow and change. And so a feminist friendship really affirms that your friend can come to you with something that's deep that they, they can't share with somebody else and they know that you're a soft place to land and vice versa. What about you, B? Um, I like article seven, we will hold each other accountable to being the best version of ourselves. And in this mm -hmm. article, we talk about this concept of a homegirl intervention. So a homegirl intervention is when your homegirl lovingly snatches your coattails to keep you from being raggedy in these streets. Homegirl interventions say, you need to read more. You need to be nice. You need to watch your tone. You need to own your shit. Someone who calls you in rather than calls you out with love. Sis, that ain't it. Sis, we better than this. Sis, Black Jesus didn't die for this. Um, and, you know, I became a feminist because, uh, in part because somebody staged a homegirl intervention for me. I was out here being like, feminism is white girl stuff. Like, it isn't for Black women. Here's the thing. I hadn't actually read anything about feminism, so I just had a whole opinion that was uninformed, right? So that's clue number one. Don't be having uninformed opinions about things. But also, thankfully... I had a homegirl who heard me say this. And so I was in college. And when I got back to the dorm that night, my girl was like, 
pulled me into her room and she was like, um, you were talking real crazy in the honors lounge today because this happened in the honors lounge. You were talking Ooh. real crazy about feminism today. Lounge. In the mm-hmm. honors lounge. I was out here with no honor. I was out here have done, having done no reading, right? Y'all know how y'all be showing up to class. You have not done the homework, but you like, miss such and such. I, I have an opinion about the text. That's, that, Don't that's do that. not it. Yeah. Yes. And so, but she was like, here, read this, right? Um, because you sound crazy and like get yourself together. But what I love about it was she didn't throw me away. She didn't say that because I wasn't woke enough and because I had made this mistake and I was out here being egregious um, that she couldn't be friends with me anymore. She just was like, here's a thing for you to read. And I actually, what I wanted, you know, at that point, I didn't want to be a feminist, but more than that, I didn't want to be raggedy. And so when I read about feminism, I was like, oh, okay, like I need to read more. So I didn't like change my opinion immediately that day, but I did feel like I have the space to grow and a good friendship will do that for you. Don't just have friends who tell you that you're right when you're clearly wrong, right? Have people who will challenge you to grow and change and expand. And conversely, right? If you're the friend who is doing the challenge and make sure that you're doing your work at the same time, you know, don't be insufferable because sometimes you know, you read a book like this, and and quite frankly, many of you are very sophisticated about gender discourse. Nobody has the right to to misgender you, to treat you raggedy, to be terrible to you. But at the same time, people are growing and they're being they're in process. And what I love is that I had a friendship. My friendships allowed me to grow into my feminism. My friends saw a thing in me and affirmed that thing in me before I could see it in myself. Um, and really good friends will do that. And then, you know, and I also felt loved. I didn't feel called out. She could have called me out in the honors office and been like, girl, you sound crazy, right? She didn't do that. You know, she waited till we were in a private moment because it wasn't about humiliation and it wasn't a flex on me. It was just like a, well, that that ain't quite it. But like, I love her. So when I get a moment, like I'm gonna address it. Mm -hmm. And that's just good friendship practice. And that's, you know, what we're trying to kind of get at. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all got questions? Let us know. Um, while y'all are coming through with your questions, uh, we, we had a comment in the chat about, uh, how the book is filled with playlists. Chanel, you want to talk about some of our playlists? Yes, because it was so fun to curate these playlists because like we said, like our feminism was also infused by music and actually, you know, I credit in the beginning of the book, we kind of go over our own, like how we became feminists and mine starts with little Kim. And so music and feminism has always been intertwined for us. So we have that bossing up playlist, which is super fun. We also have a playlist on hair, like a hair goals playlist, because there's a section that talks about natural hair and what that means for us. Um, It's called don't touch hair. So the whole book could be a playlist because like every title kind of, you know, hints at a hip hop song or saying like, even can we live is a play on can I live? which is a Jay-Z song, you know, so everything is, it's music all throughout because it's how we embody our lives. There's a self-love playlist that comes at the end of our chapter on sex. Um, and so it's that kind of self-love. There's so many playlists and book lists also and movie lists, like at, at the end of the friendship chapter, we kind of put like a whole list of movies that talk about friendship. So we have Thelma and Louise, but we also have Set It Off because we're working class girls and that's like, you know, our cult classic. And so we we have um, a lot of different lists that we curated. It was really fun to make. And those playlists you can actually find on Spotify, so. Word. Um, so uh, one of the last things, you know, that we can chat about is, you know, we have some some sections of this book that might be deemed a little bit controversial, but that I think that young people and their adults, right, be it teachers or parents or guardians, um, might be interested to hear and to know that are, that's here and that's a resource. And so, um, so what for y'all was like a particularly controversial thing that we said or that um, that you think might might land controversially for someone? Well, one thing that we mention is we talk about polyamory. We talk about ethical non-monogamy. Come on. So we don't mean that you have a boo on the baseball team, the softball team, and the soccer team, and they don't know about each other. And you just going from game to game with different bay. <laughs> we mean that you are talking to multiple people or dating multiple people, and everybody knows about each other. 
you're talking about it, you're open. You're like, I am not in a monogamous relationship. I'm dating multiple people and you are being very open and honest with one another. You're practicing enthusiastic consent and about any intimacy you're engaging with. And that is something I definitely know when I was in high school, we were not talking about that. We were talking about cheating, but that's different than ethical non-monogamy, right? We are trying to move away from a capitalist ethic where you possess your partner. Like this, this is my boo and we're together and you can't talk to anyone else. If you want to engage in non-monogamy, you can. It may not be for everyone. Maybe, you know, you, you're not trying to have multiple relationships or you're not trying to date anybody, you know? There are lots of roads to, to dating and intimacy. So that might be a little, little bit of a controversy. <laughs> Maybe, a little spicy, a little... Though you know. people get it when... I know when I was coming up, the boys could do that. Okay. You know, like they were, it wasn't ethical, <laughs> but you know, no. we, they can understand boys dating a whole lot of people. It's when the girls want to play that game too, that people get like, what are you Yeah, but about? I think it, even in old, I mean, and this is still very like cis heteronormative, but back day there was the expectation that you were supposed to court multiple people, right? Well, yeah, you're right. Courting. Courting. Back courting. Back I would add, parents, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay, so definitely in the sex chapter, I say that our kids' sex lives are none of our business. Uh, That might be a little spicy for the adults. The kids are probably like, yes, tell my mama that, please get out of my business. But what we say is that their intact virginity should not be a badge of honor for us as parents. It's an odd thing to measure our parenting success against. Our job should be providing judgment-free place for them to receive medically sound evidence-based information so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. So that's really what we're talking about. But, you know, we understand that that may not be something that folks are used to. Um, So there's a lot of snooping involved and a lot of, you know, you better not be having sex that um, happens. And we, we just think that teenagers, I mean, unless there's something, you know, of course, if uh, folks are being sexually abused and a parent thinks that that may be happening, then that's absolutely all of our business. Like, we don't want that. But, you know, I think what we're advocating for is for teenagers to have some space that they can be, that's it, that belongs to just them. Um, and I think that, you know, young folks have a right to that. At what it Should it just start at 18 when you move out the house at 21? Like, when, when does that happen if not now? So we're advocating to, like, let, let, let these babies have some privacy. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we say, too, given the sort of obsession with virginity um, is that virginity is a social construct. Right. Um, It you know, we don't sort of buy into the idea that there's some moment where you become deflowered and you become an entirely different person. And we don't buy into that in part because it is, you know, super heteronormative, you know, and it's really rooted in the idea that, you know, the traditional ways that, you know, heterosexual people have sex are the is the marker of the moment uh, where one is no longer virginal. But, you know, there are all kinds of ways to engage in sexual activity um, and to center one kind, to center sexual intercourse or penetrative sexual intercourse, right, between a man and a woman um, is, is not it, you know. And so part of what it means to do away with virginity is that we sort of reinstate the idea that people get to choose the sexual moments and experiences that are most meaningful to them and that mark the beginning of their journey. And we hope that the beginnings of that journey are marked primarily by consent and a feeling of safety uh, and ideally by some notion, like by enthusiastic consent. Uh, begrudging consent is not the consent that we're we're here for. Uh, we want, you know, and we and we even share, you know, some things we wish we had known about sex. And one of the things, you know, that we wish we had known is that we, you know, uh, is we wish we'd done it because we really wanted to do it, um, and not just because of pressure or well, it's just time to or other people are doing it that sort of thing. And so. Um, we try to have a radical politics of consent throughout this book that you have the agency to choose and that your yeses uh, matter um, as much as your noes matter. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Well, uh, if we don't have questions, uh, then we are done. We hope that you will 
buy this book and that if you're a young person that you'll use it to initiate conversations with your adults if you're if you're an adult that you'll use it to initiate conversations with your young people i mean that you will really see this as a resource as you define a politics for yourself around what feminism means and look we know that for some of you this is super basic and for others of you you are like what in the world is this but we think that there's something in here exciting for everyone um, and we are happy to be uh, in this conversation with you um, and happy for the revolution, um, you know, a world where everybody is safe, um, regardless of gender um, that we're trying to build. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your conversation. Such an important conversation for everybody, as you said, no matter what age, gender, sexual identity, um, race, et cetera. This book is really important. Here it is. Great cover. Thank you, guys. And um, Book Passage has them available. If you're interested, please um, contact us either by phone or by email, um, and we'll be happy to send it to you. You could pick it up at one of our two stores that are open in Corte Madera and in the Ferry Building in San Francisco. Um, and we want to thank again um, those of you who are joining us from schools, um, as well as our loyal supporters and our incredible authors who joined us today. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay healthy and happy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you.